Hello, everybody. It is great to see your smiling faces. Thank you for clapping. Everybody just clap for yourselves for being here. <laughs> it's so good to see uh, those of you that are here in this room and uh, for those of you who are watching in your living room or anywhere else in the world, excited that you are actually here. And I uh, want to say hello to Chris Anthony Carbajal, who is joining us online. And we have some names to pronounce. I tell you, when I moved here to New Jersey, Everywhere else I've been, it's like John Brown, but the diversity here is so crazy, I have to study the names to make sure I pronounce them 80% correctly, but it's all good. So let's give our online community a hand. So I uh, want to start with this. Has there ever been a time in your life where someone has done you wrong? Oh, man, if I could just show you the images that are popping above your heads right now. Yeah, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what we actually can do about that. Uh, we're in a series right now called Built to Last, Building a Rock Solid Family, because we live in a world where families are being torn apart. We live in a world where uh, families finishing the way they started is the exception rather than the rule. And as we said last week, we're not talking about perfection. We're all smart enough to know that there's no perfect family, no perfect marriage, no perfect kids. But what we do want to know, we want to ask and answer this question, how do you build a life and family that lasts? And last week, we talked about how important it was to, to lay the right foundation. We talked about the reality of storms hitting our lives, and we said, you got to get prepared for those things. And if you didn't get that message, you need to go back and listen to that because that's the foundational message and the most important message that you can hear for the rest of this series. But one of the things that we said was, you can't stop storms from hitting you, but you can stop them from destroying you. And we looked at the words of Jesus and his brother James, and we said, it's not enough for you to hear the words of Jesus, for you to listen to the words of Jesus. He said, this is the key, putting them into practice. And so what we're going to do over the next four weeks is just put into practice four more elements of what it means to have a rock solid family. So here's kind of where we're going. Next week, uh, we're going to talk about turning moments to memories. How in the world do you take the little moments that God gives you and leverage those so they become lasting memories? Uh, then we're going to go weigh your words. Words are very powerful. Words can build up or words can tear down. How do we live a life to make sure we're building others up? Then on Mother's Day, we're talking about hold on loosely, and this is the unique role that moms play in the life of their children. It's going to be a fantastic uh, day and a fantastic message. But today, we're going to talk about something that I have observed to be one of the least practiced elements as followers of Jesus. And it's certainly one of the least practiced elements that we see in our culture around us. Today, we're talking about resolve to forgive. Resolve to forgive. So if you have a Bible with pages that turn or a screen that scrolls, let me invite you to open it up. This is a hard one to find. It's the book of Genesis. Okay. Uh, it's, it's the first book in the Bible if you're new to the Bible. I uh, also encourage you to go to chapter 27. And then um, open up the Zarephath app if you have that. There's some blanks, some scriptures, some things in there that will help you follow along to get a little bit more out of our time together today. Now, when we talk about forgiveness, anytime somebody says forgiveness and you start talking about that theme, there, there's always this, but what about, what about, what about, what about? Because we can all automatically think of a reason why it doesn't apply to me. It's like, let me tell you, because, you know, if you knew what they did, if you knew what he did, if you knew what she did, huh, you wouldn't expect me to forgive at all. You know, we've all been in that space. Forgiveness, by the way, is easy to receive but hard to give, right? Oh, we all like being forgiven, but giving forgiveness is a completely different thing. And for many of us, we find it not only hard to forgive, there are some of us that resolve not to forgive. Why is that? Because when somebody does something to us, when they hurt us, when they wound us, it normally gets down into our heart, into our soul. It goes down so deep that we actually mistakenly believe that holding on to the hurt is the only way that we will find help. That would be an error. So this is why we have to do this. Here's what I'm calling it. We have to pre-decide 
to forgive. Because you're never going to feel like doing it when it actually happens to you. It's if we don't become the kind of people that pre-decide, who almost like a covenant say, hey, we're going to be the kind of people, I'm going to be the kind of dad, the kind of husband, you're going to be the kind of mom or the kind of wife, the kind of son or the kind of daughter, the kind of church, if we don't resolve to forgive up front, then whenever the hurt happens, here's what's going to happen. You know what we do. We have a tendency to run away, withdraw from that other person, cut off that relationship. But God says, there is another way. And I just want to give you a kind of a big idea starting up front. When we resolve to forgive, we're saying our long-term relationship is more important than my short-term hurt. Our relationship, what we have, is more important than what happened to me. So we're going to talk today about a family, actually uh, a set of brothers, twin brothers in the Hebrew Scriptures, Esau and Jacob. And something happened in their relationship that would make all of us go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can understand why there's, there's a lack of forgiveness in that relationship. Oftentimes when we talk about people in the Bible, we're like, I wonder what they looked like. And I was just, I was really, really lucky. I got into an ancient Hebrew uh, source and I found an actual picture of Esau and Jacob. And, and here it is. No, it, it, that, that's not true. But let me tell you about Esau and Jacob, okay? Esau and Jacob, uh, they come from the line of Abraham. And if you're familiar with the story of God, you know that God uh, appeared to a guy named Abraham and said, hey, I'm going to bless you if you will follow me. And I'm going to bless you so significantly that every generation that comes after you through your lineage, they're going to be blessed. And ultimately, you and I are blessed through that lineage because the person of Jesus Christ came through the line of David, through the line of Abraham. But what would happen is Abraham was going to pass it on to his eldest son, and his eldest son was a guy by the name of Isaac. Okay, then uh, Isaac would pass it on to his sons. But when it was time for Isaac to pass it on to his sons, his wife, Rebekah, gave birth to twins, Esau and Jacob. Okay, uh, Esau was coming out first. Jacob actually grabbed the heel of Esau, held on, so they both kind of came out together. And that's why he was given the name Jacob, because it literally means he grabs the heel. Figuratively, it means deceiver. So for those of you who are picking out baby names, if, ja if Jacob is on the list, just know, okay, just take that into consideration. But this idea of the blessing being passed on was huge. And so Isaac was going to pass the blessing on to Esau. And the blessing was massive in any family, but specifically in this family, because the blessing was not only the transfer of physical wealth, property, assets, it was the transfer of spiritual blessing as well, which meant whatever you touched turned to gold. You were going to be successful in every single thing that you did. So for Esau to get the blessing, this is a massive deal. Now, these brothers are as different as night and day because Esau was an outdoorsman. He loved to hunt. Uh, he, he watched uh, Dual Survivor, and uh, he shopped at Cabela's. Jacob was kind of an indoor guy. Uh, he loved to decorate. He watched uh, Design on a Dime, and he shopped at Home Goods. So they're just like as different as night and day, all right? And here's another interesting thing. Esau was favored by his father, um, uh, Isaac. Okay, you're my favorite. And Rebecca favored Jacob, which, by the way, is not a recipe for a family that is built to last. That's going to cause problems. So this blessing is going to be passed on, and uh, Isaac is getting up in the years. He's old. He can't see anymore. He's about ready to die. This is the big day, and this is where the Scripture takes us. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his oldest son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country and hunt some wild game for me. 
Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Woo! So this is very, very exciting for Esau to hear. Now here's the deal. Rebecca was eavesdropping in the other room. So she heard what was getting ready to go down and she favored Jacob. So she's got a plan. So she calls Jacob and says, listen, it's getting ready to go down. Your father is getting ready to pass the blessing on to your brother Esau, but I think there's something we can do about that. He's like, what do you mean there's something to do about that? She's like, why don't you pretend to be him? Your dad can't even see. Whoa. So why don't you go out of the field, grab a couple of goats, because he's out hunting right now. Uh, you bring some goats in. I'll prepare the meal. You take it into your father, and he won't be the wiser. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I like the idea, but uh, you know my brother's really hairy. And what if my father, like, touches me? He'll know it's not me. She says, I got that covered. Uh, I'm going to take some of the hair of the goat, and I'm going to glue it onto your hands, and then I'm going to glue it on the back of your neck, and your father won't know. Now, just a question. How hairy do you have to be <laughs> that when your father feels goat hair on your hands and the back of your neck that you actually say, yep, that's my son. I mean, this is the reality here. So, you know, this is kind of the plan. And Jacob walks in with a meal. And so uh, Isaac said, uh, Esau, is that you? Jacob says, uh, yes, father. Yes, father. <laughs> he says, well, how did you get the game so quickly? And he said, God led me right to it. Wow. That's a Jacob. And he says, well, why don't you come on over here and make sure that it's, that it's actually you. And, and these are actually uh, the words of Isaac. He says, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And the deception was so cleverly crafted that he ate the meal and he gave the blessing to the wrong son. No sooner had the words left his mouth, in walks Esau with his own meal. But it was too late. The meal had been eaten. The blessing had been given. The room was filled with anger and confusion and outrage. Isaac couldn't believe what Jacob had done to him. Esau couldn't believe what Jacob had stolen from him. It was a painful time. This is what the Scripture says. says, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. This is like a scene out of the Godfather. I mean, this is real life. So Rebecca says, listen, you're going to get killed. You need to get out of here. My brother lives miles away from here. His name is Laban. Why don't you go stay with him? And so he escapes the wrath of Esau. Jacob goes down, starts a brand new life at his uncle Laban's house. Twenty years go by. And the blessing worked. Jacob is wildly successful. He's now got 12 sons. So much money, so many cattle, so many sheep, so many goats, so much livestock. His business is so thriving, it cannot be contained on the land that he's currently living on. So he has to move to another location so he can take all of his stuff with him. The only problem is the only way to get where he needs to go is directly in the pathway of his brother Esau. And isn't it interesting that this happens? God puts people we need to forgive in our path. You ever notice that? You try to get away from them or they try to get away from you. But reconciliation is so important to the heart of God that he's going to orchestrate encounters. He's going to make sure that people who need to forgive and people who need to be forgiven are going to be brought together in the same space, in the same room, in the same family at times. Because God wants reconciliation to happen. Now, 20 years later, Jacob is confronted with a strained relationship between him and his brother. 
And so he has a plan because he's kind of a manipulative person. And so what he's going to do is he's going to actually send gifts to his brother. And so he sends messengers ahead and basically said, hey, your brother Jacob is coming to meet you and he's got lots of presents for you. Let's pick it up in chapter 32 of verse 6. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau and now he's coming to meet you. Happy thoughts. Maybe this is a good thing. And then they go, oh, well, here's the rest of that one. And 400 men are with him. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) Uh-oh. He's got his little army with him as well. So he goes from, oh, my brother. Oh, my brother. Oh, brother. Indeed. And nobody really knows what's going on in the heart of Esau. Nobody really knows what has been building up inside of him. Probably revenge. So Jacob knows this, and now he's like, whoa, 400 men? All right, I got to up my game. So he actually sends gifts in waves. And the way he does this, he puts his children ahead of him. So there'll be one of the 12 there, and they would be bringing gifts with some servants, and then they would be followed maybe 500 uh, feet or so by another. And so basically 12 waves of gifts are coming to Esau because he's hoping that maybe all these gifts will wipe away a 20-year grudge. Because we all know, do we not, that when you give somebody a present, it takes away all of the betrayal. But this is his hope. This is all that he's got. But is it going to work? There's a, one of my favorite bands is called One Republic, and they have a a song called Apologize, and uh, they have lyrics that kind of speak into this moment. It says, I'm holding on your rope, got me 10 feet off the ground, and I'm hearing what you're saying, but I just can't make a sound. You tell me that you need me, then you go and cut me down. You tell me that you're sorry, didn't think I'd turn around and say that it's too late to apologize. It's too late. I said it's too late to apologize. It's too late. Anybody ever sing that song to somebody? Yeah. Yeah, you should have been here a long time ago. It's been a month. It's been two years. It's been five years. Now you're coming back to me? I don't think so. Is it too late? For Jacob, 20 years had gone by. Revenge has to be building up inside of Esau. And the Scripture actually says that when Esau got close enough to his brother and he saw him, he actually took out his bow and he pulled back the arrow and he shot it right into his heart and he died on the spot. No, that's not what happened. But you would expect that to happen, right? You're like, that's how that thing goes down, man. No, that's not what happened. This is actually what happened. Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Now, we don't know what was going on in those 20 years, but there's one thing we do know. God was at work in the heart of Esau. You don't do that after what has been done to you unless God was actually at work. And somewhere along the way, Esau decided that forgiveness was a better choice than revenge. See, when we resolve to forgive, here's what's happening. We're saying, I forgive before you ever ask for it or if you never ask for it. You say, well, well, I thought somebody had to say I'm sorry for, for me to forgive. No, no, no. There's two kinds of forgiveness. There's the kind of forgiveness that says, I'm letting go of this. I'm giving this over to God, and I want everything to be right here, and I don't want it to eat me up inside. And there's another kind of forgiveness that has more to do with reconciliation, meaning if a person never comes to you, never says, I'm sorry, never asks for forgiveness, you might not re-enter into a relationship with them for sure, but you don't want to hold on to that forgiveness because guess who's going to pay in the end? You. You. You've got to pre-decide, I'm going to do something with this, no matter what they choose to do. 
Now, does anybody else talk about this? If you fast forward uh, 4,000 years into the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, okay, Romans chapter 12, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote about this. And he's speaking into a community much like this, people who have relationships, who have families, people who have been wronged and are carrying a lot of hurt around. And he's going to say, let me tell you a little bit about that. So I want to go back to the question we asked at the beginning. Has there ever been a time in your life where someone has done you wrong? Lied to you? Cheated on you? Stole something from you? Tarnished your reputation? Has there anybody done anything like that? And, and if they have, and I know the answer to the question is yes, then you know the reason why it's so hard to forgive. Because if we forgive, then they don't pay. And when somebody does something to us that is so damaging, it hurt us so deeply, and the wound is still open, granting them forgiveness seems like I'm letting them off the hook. And when somebody wounds us, honestly, revenge seems more fitting than forgiveness. Revenge feels better. And revenge gives us a sense that, yeah, they got what they deserved. Now, we all understand this in movies. Anybody, just be totally honest with me. You know the movies where some guy did something so vile and despicable to another guy's wife or daughter that that person just like goes on an all-out rampage to hunt that person down and take them out? Anybody like watching those movies? Yeah, we love that. Because revenge feels so good. You remember this movie right here, Taken? Yeah, this guy's daughter was kidnapped and sold into sex slavery. And somehow, you know, he gets on the phone with a kidnapper and he says he has a particular set of skills. And then he has this famous line. He says, I will find you and I will kill you. And he does. And when we're watching that, we're like, yay. <laughs> we want to see that because revenge feels so good. Now, that's a movie, and we do all believe that justice needs to be pursued, but most of the time, justice is out of our hands, and all we're left with is what we're going to do emotionally with the hurt that is sitting inside of us. The Apostle Paul said, you know, uh, revenge feels good for a while. Revenge feels good, but only for a little while. But if you don't do something about that, it's going to eat you up from the inside out. He actually says it this way. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, when it comes to forgiveness, we're not saying that what was done to you wasn't a big deal. It was a big deal. In fact, it might be, in the words of Scripture, evil. It might have actually been evil, but he says, listen, it is not your job to deal with this. He says, here's what you need to do. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. He says, leave room for this. And here's the deal with revenge. Because whenever we get wronged, every single one of us lives by a code. And when somebody wrongs us, when they violate our sense of justice, we're kind of like, whoa, whoa, anybody see that? Did you see what they... And we're kind of appealing to a higher court. Because when somebody does us wrong, we want to make sure that justice is actually done. We want to make sure that somebody gets due what is due them. And we want justice to be served. 
But here's what happens when we decide, okay, I am going to pursue revenge. Basically, there are three things. One, revenge is saying to ourselves, I guess it's up to me. Revenge is saying to others, you're going to pay. And revenge is saying to God, I'll take it from here. I'll take it from here. I got this. I'm going to play God for a little while. Now, I know, you know, these are very, very hard things to hear. But I'm afraid if we don't pay attention to this, something bad is going to happen. And let me tell you why this is a bad idea. Paul said in another place, he said, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger, read, read those yellow lines with me, gives a foothold to the devil. Wow. Now, I want to show you something really interesting that I found in my study this week. That little phrase, uh, date tapan, okay, is the, is the Greek phrase, translated leave room, okay, when it says leave room for God's wrath. It's also the very same phrase that is used here that means gives a foothold to the devil. So you could say leaves room to the devil if you wanted to translate it that way. You say, well, where are you going with that? Here's the deal. If we don't leave room for God to work, then we leave room for Satan to work. That's what happens when you hold a grudge, when you hold on to uh, your lack of forgiveness, when you say, I'm going to make somebody else pay. Satan's like, "Woo, man, do we have some room to work here? Hey, everybody, calls all of his demons over. Look at this one. They think they're going to to be the boss by withholding forgiveness. Everybody ready for this one? Yeah! You know, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> um, but they know. And God's like, oh, I would love to work in your life. I would love to set you free, but you, there's no room for me in there. You gave Satan all the room. You let him feed your anger, your bitterness, your resentment. It's growing and growing and growing. You know, let's like, it's inside you like a monster. You've got to leave room for the right person. And I know this sounds really, really heavy, you know, for a family setting, maybe for a church setting, a small group setting. Uh, you're like, I'm not trying to kill anybody. I know. But even in a family, there, there are wounds, there are resentments. There's anger that gives you the power to pay somebody back with whatever power you have in the family. So uh, maybe your husband like shut down an opportunity that you were really excited about. And uh, so as a wife, you're like, you know what? I'm just going to make you pay by treating you with contempt. Or maybe your wife said something disrespectful at a social gathering and kind of embarrassed you in front of people. And now you're like, well, okay. And you're going to make her pay by giving her the silent treatment. Or maybe your mom and dad violated your sense of independence. And so now you're going to make them pay by withdrawing from the family. Or maybe you have a friend or maybe your brother or sister, uh, they said something that kind of put you in a bad light. And now you're going to make them pay by spreading rumors about them or attacking them on social media. And the truth of the matter is, revenge, secretly, it feels good. It feels good to hold a grudge. And we think that we're making people pay, but the reality is we are the one that are paying in the end because that bitterness gets inside of us and we can't get rid of it. We are overwhelmed and overcome. And this is why Paul says this. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. Well, what's the good? The good is forgiveness. So you really got a couple of choices here. Number one, you can do this. You just take revenge. Get it. Get you some of that. Participate in the evil. Pay back evil for evil. But let me tell you something about evil. You start flirting with evil. You start messing around with evil. It's kind of like this. It's like tree sap. Anybody ever get tree sap on them? You get it on this finger, and then you're like, oh, oh crap. Then it's over here, and then you try to wipe, and then it's over here. And the next thing you know, it is all over you. That's how evil is. You start flirting with evil. You think I can do it once and then brush it off? No, 
It's sticky. It's tacky. You can't get it off of you. So you can do that if you want, but it's going to tear you up from the inside out. The second choice is resolve to forgive. Overcome evil with good. Let the right choice of forgiving somebody else release you from the oppression and the power that anger and bitterness has over your life right now. And ultimately, this is all about giving it to God. It's kind of like this. When we resolve to forgive, we're saying, God, I trust you with what needs to be done about what they did to me. You're God. I'm not God. You're the only one that is holy, the only one that is perfect, the only one who has the right to judge another person. I don't. And you're giving it up to God. Forgiveness is the good that allows us to overcome evil. And God will give you the grace to grant it because he granted it to you first. Now, in relationships, in families, in small groups, in women's groups, men's groups, whatever the case might be, I believe that we need commitments, almost a covenant that we have with one another instead of just going, I'm going to be a forgiving person. There has to be some practice behind that. And so uh, I'm going to be sending out a tool to you this week, and it's these forgiveness commitments. They go like this. Number one, as a friend or family member, I resolve to forgive. This is going to be my starting point. Number two, when I feel hurt by something you did, I won't harbor anger but come directly to you. Number three, once I've processed my hurt through counsel and prayer, I'll forgive you and turn it over to God. Number four, when you come to me with something I've done, I'll own it and ask your forgiveness. And then finally, once I've asked for forgiveness, I'll do what is right uh, and whatever it takes to make things right. I think if we practice these things, everything would change. And when we resolve to forgive, we are one step closer, one step closer to a family, to a life that is built to last. So I want to end with a question. Who do you need to forgive? I don't even need to present a list of scenarios because you know who it is. And we're going to close this message by sharing communion together. And I can tell you this is a very powerful reminder of forgiveness. And so when you hold in your hand this little piece of bread and this cup, you need to understand that the writer Paul said, Forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Who do you need to forgive? As you are participating in this and you are receiving, you are being reminded of the forgiveness that you have received from God through Jesus, maybe you whisper a prayer. God, I resolve to forgive And then you fill in the blank. And then you make a commitment not only to forgive, but if you can, to tell them that that's been done. And if somebody is coming to you and asking for forgiveness, maybe your choice is to go, it's it's hard, but yeah, I'm going to release that. And that God would broker a relationship between you and that person, just like Jesus brokered a relationship between you and God when he hung on the cross and bled and died for you. So as a reminder of that, let's take the bread in remembrance of him. In the same way that Jesus took the bread and gave it to his disciples, he took a cup And he said, 
this cup represents my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take it in remembrance of him. And then there's just one other thing that I think it would be important to say is that maybe you're in this room or maybe you're watching online and the forgiveness that you need isn't a forgiveness from another person. It's forgiveness from God because you've never dealt with the sin that stands between you and a relationship with God. This bread and this cup that we just took represents the reality that Jesus hung on a cross and he was tortured and beaten and crucified. But he spoke the most unbelievable words. He said, Father, forgive them. And so that same Jesus was buried and rose again and he is right now alive and he is offering you forgiveness. And all you need to do is come to grips with your sin, your brokenness, that you need to say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner just like everybody else in the world. I admit that it's an obstacle between me and you and there's nothing that I can do about it. I don't have enough uh, works. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. Nothing can take care of that. I receive what Jesus did on the cross as the one and only way for me to have a relationship with you. And right now, I receive the gift of eternal life that is offered through Jesus. If that's your prayer, if that's your heart, uh, I want to welcome you to the family of God. Let's give those people a hand who made that decision. We'd love to reach out to you. And so after the service, we'll have people that you can pray with, ask any questions about uh, your journey. And uh, God is going to lead you into a whole new realm of life. Let's pray together. Well, God, this is such a difficult topic. And honestly, we don't have the power to do anything about this. But like most things in our life, our power, Holy Spirit, comes from you. And so for those of us who are followers of Jesus, would you fill us with your spirit so that there is nothing that stands in the way of us reconciling with others, of us being like you, Jesus, loving and living and serving like you. And I pray that all of this transformation would start right here with us, with our families, with this family of God here, and the work that you are doing inside of us would make us the kind of people that are known to be forgivers and that we would stand out as a bright, shining light in our community and our schools and our workplaces because we are living so differently than everybody else in the culture. We are letting go because we are letting you, God, be in control. And so help us to forgive one another because you, in Christ, have forgiven us. We pray in his name. Amen.